Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Reference versus Master Data Management, sponsored today by Informatica and Reltio. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights, or, uh, highlights via LinkedIn or your favorite social media platform. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link to the recording of the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Robert for a brief word from our first sponsor, Informatica. Robert, hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. Let me uh, share here. Good to, to be um, presenting today with Dr. Aiken and, and Satya. So, right. Well, I have the, the honor of representing um, Informatica um, in this conversation today. So, being one of the companies out there that are in the reference and MDM space, um, I lead their global community of practice for reference data management. I myself have been in the space for 25 plus years, started out as a customer, and then from there got into implementations and into software uh, sales. So today, the theme that I'm going to follow for the presentation is just talking about how this can be very simple, quick, AI-powered for the enterprise, as well as a all-in-one offering that we have with Informatica to uh, to do this. So the first place we're going to go is talk about solution we have around reference data. So we have a cloud-native master data management solution that focuses on reference data. Takes a little bit different approach to the master data management paradigm than you see with our other applications, which start out with the um, cleansing, deduping, doing that, whereas reference data is more often handled by business users. So what we do is enable those business users to centralize the definition, governance, and oversight of their reference data for the entire enterprise. And then from there, uh, being a SaaS solution, it's very quick to be able to realize this. So we've seen customers with up to 85% increase in efficiency um, using this SaaS solution where they're coming in to customize um, what they're adding to it instead of having to, to build or uh, configure those. Uh, we can help uh, create dashboards and visualizations in, in minutes, as well as powered by intuitive AI uh, enable processes with that low code, no code configuration for those. And as we were talking, get a little bit more on the AI powered, um, the, um, the Informatica's, our Informatica data management platform um, is AI powered with our Claire application at the center of that to help with the matching um, smart key generation, uh, training processes for product matching, including augmented matching for high performance scale um, and matching user related entities for high granular refinement, glossary integration, um, as well as the ability to share reference data across the MDM platform. And from here, talk about the enterprise piece. So the way we look at reference data is not only reference data, but also governance, because without the governance, the rules of the road that you're going to follow, the reference data um, becomes key in that. So as a governance process, you're setting up those rules of the road. Reference data management and the other MDM applications are where that governance becomes actionable. 
And what do I mean by actionable? Well, actionable means that at that point, we can enforce those rules as changes and updates are occurring. We are able to ensure that those are meeting those compliance, those data governance rules. Um, and whether that's accessing and ingesting those, discovering or cleansing and enriching, but make sure those are all in the right business context. In some of the areas that we're seeing customers utilize reference data here, um, these are in broad categories on the left is enterprise. So looking at those corporate, those structures that you're looking to do from a reporting perspective. So whether that's um, defining compliance with regulations and transactions or operational overhead and efficiencies helping um, work through those. Then finance and accounting, so looking at those reports to drive accurate financial reporting uh, for the marketplace. And then when you get into industry and healthcare, mapping those code sets, whether those are billing codes or whether those are codes for um, the different disease diagnostic codes, helping with claim payments and a centralized platform to align those taxonomies and mappings, and then finally brand hierarchy overview. So this is all done in a all-in-one uh, platform with the uh, within Informatica, and we've got applications, whether it's customer, all the way over to any domain, focusing today, obviously, on, on Reference 360. So appreciate your time today as one of the sponsors. Um, and from here, I'll turn it back over to you, Shannon. All right, thank you so much. And if you have questions for Robert or about Informatica, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion as he'll be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar today. Now, let me turn it over to our second sponsor, Reltios, and introduce Su Chen. Su Chen, hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. My name is Sitan Charankar. I'm Principal Product Manager at Trelgeo. Been in this space for close to 20 years. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about reference data versus uh, master data management. So I want to start by just defining what reference data is. So reference data is a non-volatile, slow-moving subset of master data. So if you look at some of the examples here, we can start from there. Zip country, specialty code, identifier types, and those kind of things. So when you look at the data across your uh, different domains, like individual products and things like that, uh, there's a lot of variation that is what you're trying to kind of, you know, deduplicate and match. But there are some attribution that basically do not change that much, right? State, the country, those, those are some of the examples. So that's what is uh, one of the ways of looking at this reference data, uh, which is sort of, you know, a subset of master data. Uh, so before I dive into uh, how Relgeo manages the reference data, I want to talk a little bit about the Relgeo platform. So Relgeo platform is a modern uh, cloud native uh, MDM platform. Uh, we deliver on our mission is by unifying, standardizing and enriching your core business data, whether it is customer, location, product, supplier, or any domain for that matter. Uh, our AI powered data unification and management capabilities include Entity resolution, which is basically the uh, deduplication of any entity type that you might have, multi domain MDM, and data products. This delivers like trusted data in real time with security, scalability, and uh, agility for you to keep up with your evolving business needs. In the SaaS offering, this, this some of this uh, security, agility, uh, scalability, all of this can basically comes in built uh, with high availability, disaster recovery. So you have a continuous access to your trusted data in real time. Uh, I want to uh, kind of dive a little uh, deeper into, you know, how we activate data or basically how we uh, approach uh, some of the implementation. So we take a business first approach to the data management. What you see on the right are basically the drivers or, or basically the, uh, the, the focus of uh, the use cases that we focus on. Our customers typically start with some of these uh, boxes what you see here is the growth efficiency and ability to manage and uh, manage risk and compliance. And the way we do this is by enabling business initiative right from the get-go. So some of those things are built into the product and you can just start activating this, just load your data and basically start kind of, you know, uh, activating some of these use cases. 
let's take a look at the capability that enables this from the MDN perspective, right? So some of the core capabilities of the MDN platform enables you to unify, cleanse, and enrich your core data. And RDM, which I've highlighted here, is natively integrated feature of our MDM product. So this is basically something that you uh, you can just uh, load and kind of you know try to manage uh, the reference data uh, uh, across multiple source systems. In addition to RDM, uh, these capabilities that enable you to create trusted interoperable data, it's like entity resolution with ML based and rule based match merge uh, uh, processes built into ability to view and manage relationship. And there are simplified integration with thousands of connector uh, and no low, uh, no low code, no uh, code development environment uh, available in the platform. I want to expand this a little bit and show you the end-to-end the, the -end picture here. Right? At, the, at the core, you can see the uh, cloud foundation, which we support. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, the real time uh, for low uh, latency at scale, high availability, and the clouds that we support, AWS, Azure, um, uh, GCP. On the top, what you see here is the velocity path for the market segment. These are pre-built industry-specific components that accelerate time to value. What that means is uh, all of this uh, velocity path that you see here and the data domain that is uh, listed under that are pre-built and it, they are ready to go, ready to activate, right? So you just have to bring your data and you can start activating them without any additional coding or configuration required. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, built-in reference data management capability that I uh, mentioned at the beginning, right? So it allows you to create, manage, and standardize uh, the reference data with built-in. You can see a little snip, uh, snapshot of uh, the application on the right that allows you to kind of define different various uh, 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 codes and manage a complex relationship. Uh, this reduces the IT burden uh, with, with the configuration and lookup transport REST API for the uh, reference data. Now the localization is also built in, so you can manage different languages, different data, character set right in this tool. Uh, here, uh, I just quickly wanted to basically call out uh, what differentiates us in the market. So in short, it's a nice business responsiveness. So first, it's a real-time inter interoperable data that we provide, allowing you to gain adva advantage in your, uh, how, how you respond to the market needs, right? Uh, your, your data environment needs to adjust rapidly changing business uh, requires. So we, we talked about that uh, thousands of pre-built connectors which are ready to go and all you have to do is just activate them and, and you can start integrating with any of the uh, downstream system or uh, upstream system that you might have. In the first uh, cloud native MDM SaaS platform, our focus has always been taking the platform to the next level with industry specific uh, pre built components and the power of AI. We are the first in the industry to use Gen AI and LLM to drive 10x productivity gains. Uh, I want to just highlight some of the uh, world's top brands that are running on Relcio here uh, using our platform to accelerate the value of their data. And we're very excited to to outgrow the MDM category by 15, uh, 15x. Uh, I, I want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to uh, talk a little bit about our Relcio platform. I want to hand it back to Shannon, and I'll be here to answer any questions that you might have about the Relcio platform. Thank you. And thank you so much. And thanks to Relcio for sponsoring today's webinar and to both sponsors to help make these webinars happen. If you have any questions for Suchen, he, as he said, he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end as well. So feel free to keep those questions coming in the Q&A portion. And now uh, let me introduce our speaker for the webinar series, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an acknowledged data management authority and associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, president of DAMA International, and he is the associate director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are many firsts. Starting before Google, before data was big, and before data science, Peter has founded several organizations that have helped more than 200 organizations leverage data, specific savings, which have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. His latest is Anything Awesome. And with that, and let me turn it over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. 
And hello and welcome, Shannon. Hi, everybody. It's uh, so good to see you all here today. Of course, I can't actually see you, but uh, it is uh, still nevertheless great to be connected with so many people around the world on this. Uh, obviously, our topic today is essential reference and master data. And I started out, of course, by trying to ask AI to give me a graphic to illustrate this. You can see it on the left there. It doesn't really understand this concept yet. And I'm hoping that at the end of this, you guys will have a much better understanding. And I'm certainly thankful for both of our sponsors for setting the stage so well. Informatico with the really great product suite that they have, and then Reltio with a very specific focus on MDM and master data. On this. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, basically, start out with a high-level overview of data management just to place this in context. We'll dive into specifically what is reference and master data management, why are they important, and then we'll talk about how to get started in this, which is a series of building blocks. We'll then do a little bit around guiding principles and best practices and finish around the top of the hour with some takeaways and references and things like that. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, so start out here with a, a, a bit around Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what that is, is that if you have food, clothing, shelter needs, you are probably never, ever going to be safe. And if you're never safe, then you're never going to be part of something bigger than what you are. And if you're never part of something bigger than you are, you don't know where you are relative to where everybody else is. And that prevents us from getting to be self-actualizing. And of course, self-actualization is the goal for everybody in this area. In the TED world, if you're familiar with the TED Talks, this is, concept is called flow. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because data management has a very similar golden triangle. You can see in this golden triangle, I've added some of the great buzzwords that are here, blockchain, big data. Anybody remember big data? Uh, these are, of course, the advanced data management practices, and they can't happen really without foundational practices. And I'm showing these foundational practices in the bottom here, where you see that governance, quality, strategy, platform architecture, and data operations are necessary but insufficient prerequisites to doing master data management around this. The real challenge with this, and again, aside from our, our, our sponsors that are here, we have an awful lot of people around the world that try to sell these as technology solutions. Of course, they do involve technology, but really what we're talking about from a data management perspective are the need to have organizational capabilities around this. And so even though I explain this time and time and again, people still ask me if you can do it faster. And the answer is yes, of course we can go faster, but if we go faster, it will take longer. If we go faster, it will cost more. If we go faster, it will deliver less. And if we go faster, it will present greater risk. Now I'm gonna take these five foundational practices and move them up into here where these integrated practice areas that we have, managing data coherently, governing the assets professionally, making sure that you have a good life cycle management, that there is fit for purpose data, data of known quality throughout the entire organization, and that you have the appropriate platform and technology stack uh, that relate to all these with, of course, appropriate supporting practices. And the real challenge for most organizations is that they don't have a good foundation. So trying to do master data management when your practice level is at initial really gets to something that we call the weak link in the chain. And I've illustrated that in the lower left-hand corner there. Uh, that chain is only as strong as that paper clip that you see in there. That's the first level of maturity in this. The second level is managed, which means we have the ability to actually do something on a repeated basis. Then we have defined that basis. We have written it down. Let's get three points for if you have uh, any of that process being measured, you now have the ability to gain four points in this per second. And then you get, if you use those measurements on a regular basis to improve your existing practices, you now have optimization capabilities that are there. And all of these, of course, are necessary. Once again, just as a quick illustration, if all of these organization components were rated at a level three, that they have some definition around them and all. And yet we had one area that was not, the entire chain is at a level one because the entire chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And your foundational data can only be as strong as the weakest link. Data therefore is not broadly or widely understood. It's like the blind people approaching an elephant. They each get a different part of the elephant and gain a different perspective in terms of what's going on with it. Data is very much like that. Some people look at it as warehouses, some people pipes, some people storytelling. None of these are wrong, 
but unfortunately they don't have a unified set of knowledge and skills. And this is something that we're trying to do with this webinar series is help everybody around the world gain these practices and, and gain this understanding. So we used to define data management as everything that happens between when data is sourced and when data is used. And while that's an interesting definition, it really ignores one important aspect, which is that data is, of course, more valuable if you reuse it than if you instead just use it. So a better still definition of data management means that we have several different types of sources over here and a number of different engineering disciplines, collection, evaluation, preparation, evolving your data, accessing it and storing it. And then, of course, we have exploitation features that come on the other side of it. This is where data science and storytelling uh, belong in here. And that while that is all dedicated to using data, we also have to understand that a large portion of what we're doing as data management practitioners around the world is to develop reusable data, reusable practice, and reference and master data are absolutely essential to this entire architecture for the reasons that uh, Sushin described in his very brief talk earlier and that we will be able to come back to in a little bit. So that's a quick overview of data management. Let's now dive into what is reference and master data management here. And part of this is to recognize that CIOs and chief data officers, data leaders of all types feel a great deal of pressure because they are all told by the vendor community they need to do certain things, they need to buy certain technologies. And unfortunately, there, that pressure is real and many of them succumb to it. But not many actually do what's called vendor promise auditing, which is to go back and say, when somebody says something's going to happen, what do they get? And they don't understand what is called the hype cycle in this. Now, the hype cycle is something that we attribute to Lady Ada, in this case, Ada, Augusta Ada King, was the Countess of Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron, and most importantly for us, the publisher of the very first computer program. And her wonderful words, which are still true today and have been stolen, literally, by a Gartner Group, is in considering any new subject, there is frequently, frequently a tendency to first overrate what we find already interesting or remarkable, and secondly, by a sort of natural reaction to undervalue the true state of the case. I said that Gartner stole this, they absolutely did. Here's the Gartner hype cycle that you see. Technology triggers start at this point in time and reach very quickly to the peak of inflated expectations. Of course, you know the next thing that is going to happen, we're going to fall to the trough of dissolution. It's really great. It really is terrible. The answer, of course, is somewhere in between. And the only way we will find that is by working our way up the slope of enlightenment to what we call the plateau of productivity. The reason I'm showing you this is because this is the Gartner hype cycle for data management here. And you can see in yellow, I have circled that master data management is in fact on the plateau of productivity. It is headed up towards that. They're saying it is still two to five years from a true maturation as a discipline, but it has already gone through the ups and downs that most new stuff has to come. I'm just going to point out two little quick things that are interesting here. Data mesh, you can see, is about to fall into the trough of disillusionment, and data fabric is already halfway falling down that. So these are topics that uh, Gartner, at least, has said are not really relevant to what's going on here. They have some time to go, some maturing, if at all, they're going to do it. And of course, the X through data mesh means they consider it dead on arrival. Now, we're not here to talk about data mesh. We're instead talking about reference and master data management. And this is part of the DEMA, DM Bach, the DEM Bach. And we just released a new version of this. It is a version two revised that is there. But you can see it shows the practice areas that we have around this, reference and master data being one of those core areas. Let's get to a definition. As Suchin said, it is control over the defined domain values, the vocabulary that you have in your organization standard terms, codes, values, unique identifiers, and really, if we're going to maintain them carefully, it makes sense to maintain them in exactly one place. It's kind of like having two watches. They probably are unlikely to tell you the exact same time. So this gives you the official business definitions, allowing for shared use of the understanding, the metadata that goes around this. Let me give you a very specific example that's a good teachable place for many organizations. We may start out with the definition of customer and then very quickly realize that it's probably not a good idea to treat all of our customers the same. 
for example, I was sold a car at one point in time and then told the next month by Toyota that that car that I had just bought the month before was on sale for less than I had paid for it. Toyota couldn't tell the difference between its current customers and its potential customers. Quite frankly, they still can't. Don't get me wrong. I love Toyotas, but uh, they do have a problem with this. It also is really helpful to introduce other concepts into this process, such as what's the definition of an X customer? Is that a current customer that doesn't buy from us anymore? Or is it a potential customer who should buy from us more? And further, the ability to define customers further still, such as residential versus commercial. And probably something that's a frustration to many organizations, the inability of some organizations to treat some of their customers as VIPs. So reference data management as a whole gives us this. Let's look at reference in particular. Reference data is how we speak of the specific value domains. Now, value domains are the allowable values by a database by definition. So in most relational databases, which is still the vast majority of them out there in the world, we have to have some definition. So here is one way of describing Czechoslovakia, if we wanted to describe it as a country. On the other hand, it then became the Czech Republic, and then still, it just became EZ. Uh, so these are terms that were used by different people at different times, and we need an official definition if we are going to reach our Czechoslovakian customers around here. The idea, of course, is that with an order status, we might have four states that the order might be in. It's brand new, it's in progress, it's closed, or it's canceled. Luckily for orders, they don't seem to have much more about the world, but we might also need to include the concept of revised. And if that isn't an allowable value in there, it's the way in which your organization maintains revision to an order may become problematic. Another way to look at this from a reference data perspective is the two-state abbreviation codes. Uh, in Virginia, the state that I live in, it is VA. Uh, there are reference data sets here, and we may see some things such as uh, uh, U.S. might be designated as U.S., and United Kingdom may be designated as Great Britain. That's the official standard for it, not the U.K. But if you're using U.K. and allowing users to input U.K. into there as reference data, then you will have a challenge to identify all of your U.K. customers unless you know that you need to write a query that says, let's get both GB and UK into that particular query. So that's reference data. Now let's flip over and look at master data, data about business entities that provides context for the transaction beyond the predefined values that I've already described to you here. Uh, it comes from the old term of reference, uh, excuse me, of master data, uh, uh, files that were back in the ancient days where us with gray hair, uh, uh started our, our careers many, many moons ago, but it's parties, locations, and these business rules dictate certain allowable formats and values that are in here, providing, as I said before, the context for uh, different types of transactions. And again, as I said, it came from the term master file. Let me just give you a very specific example. In the old days, we might start out where a bank such as Capital One might say, I had a balance of $100. And then if I decide to go to buy lunch, assuming I can get lunch for $5 any place these days, uh, then that becomes a transaction. And in a nightly update program, my balance would then be reduced by $5 to $95. That would be the master data. That's the balance that I have in my bank account or on my charge card, depending on what's going on. Of course, good programming practices dictate that we need to observe whether there is something wrong there or not. Uh, having a negative balance, for example, might indicate a problem on that. So the master data starts out at $100, is debited by $5, and now the new balance becomes $95. Let me give you an example of reference versus master data. So in this example, the reference data, again, the defined vocabulary, in this case, talks specifically about an example that occurred in Canada, where I was involved in a very uh, infamous lawsuit at one point in time that had to do with these specific values. Uh, in Canada at the time, you had to maintain nine values. These were the values that you had to maintain by law in Canada in order to do this. The reference data is the fact that we had these nine gender specific codes. If you didn't, you were found in violation of specific Canadian law. 
the master data on this would be the ability for us to look and say that the golden source of data gives us the gender for our customer path, whatever that is. It may be, don't know, won't tell. There's lots of different examples that you can have with this, but both the reference and the master data provide context for the transaction data. So official definitions here, uh, again, planning, implementation, and control activities. Notice we're describing a much more holistic approach rather than just simply the technology that ensure consistency with respect to the golden version of these contextual values. By the way, if you're not on this webinar or you may be on here thinking we're supposed to be talking about the other MDM, which is mobile device management. Yes, acronyms are important and it's important to know which we're talking about here. Gartner correctly in this instance holds that master data management is a discipline or a strategy. It's not a technology, but it's often sold that way. And that's why it's important for all of you to realize there is no such thing as a technology silver bullet, but that it requires discipline in the approach around our parties, our places, and our things that the business creates information about. I'm going to go back to that just because I want to make sure that I emphasize uh, that correctly. And I advanced the slide just a quick too fast. So once again, here, it is the idea that we have parties, that we have places, and that we have things. And all of those basic pieces, and you can see there's lots of examples that are in there, uh, are the main things that you would put as candidates for managing master data within your organization. I want to draw your attention to one in particular. Notice I have put LEI with a couple of stars around it. That's the legal entity identifier. And the absence of that master data was one of the primary causes of the financial crash of 2007, 2008. The Great Recession is what they call it. So master data should have been a solution and in fact has been developed as a response to that failure of the financial environment in order to do that. So now let's look and talk about why they're important. And my good friend, Chris Bradley, uh, has given me a wonderful slide that he gave me permission to use in here. When we talk about reference data, you see that little yellow dot in the upper right-hand side of your screen. Reference data should be tiny for the organization. You don't need a lot of it, but what you do need to have is make sure it's correct. For example, what countries are we doing business in? What type of accounts are available? What are the control vocabulary items? If you don't have countries that you do business in, when your business becomes large enough to expand into multiple countries, you will have to go back and re-architect your platform in a way that's generally very uncomfortable and productive. Now, from that reference data, that controls some values in the master data context. Are you a member of our premium club? Uh, are you authorized? to use uh, the particular service that you're trying to do? Are there common data structures that we're using within the organization here? And finally, we get to our transaction data, which is the vast majority of all of this, which is the $5 that I spent to buy lunch, whether I am in fact an authorized user or whether you are liking something in a particular social network context in here. Master data management can make data governance easier Again, notice what I'm saying here. It is not that I'm promising it's going to be easy, but all of these technologies and approaches can help make it easier. It's very important when we look at this in the context of strategy, and I'm just going to spend a minute here understanding strategy with you. The word strategy was not really used in business until about 1950 when Peter Drucker discovered it and started making it a tenant of management which became this master plan and grand design, but most unfortunately, it became a thing. So you'll see them around a hundred page strategy, a thousand points, uh, a PowerPoint deck, uh, you know, all of these things. It's really better to go back and look at strategy from the context of the military, which is where it was invented. And the definition in the military is a pattern in a stream of decisions. That implies rather than strategy being a thing, that strategy is in fact a process. Let me give you an example of how some organizations have struggled with this. Organizations will often buy a master data management solution, which includes in addition to that, of course, the reference data as well, but that's one leg of a three-legged stool. And unfortunately, that stool tends to fall over. 
Uh, I can remember walking the halls of one of the groups that I was working with, and I overheard somebody saying, well, I didn't know where to put the data, so I stuck it in the MDM. Well, of course, our school has just collapsed at that point. And in this little story that I'm telling here, there was general agreement that we needed to restart the effort. They went to a root cause analysis and came up with the consensus that there was poor quality data involved in this process and that the poor quality data was really as a result of inadequate training. So the response was, let's get started making data quality better. Now that's another topic, another webinar that Shannon and I will be happy to present to you later this year, but it gives you a little bit more of that stool here. It uh, still speaks to immature data quality practices, keeps the focus on technology overtly inappropriately, and they purchase a data quality stool. Now, this gets to one of my most profound insights, which I'm sure is nothing new to you all. Bad data plus any awesome thing is still going to be bad results. In master data management, you also have a series of interdependencies here. And I'm going to show some that are more or less typical. They are not the only ones that are here, but data governance is makes the case for and is responsible for data quality. Data quality, then, is a necessary but insufficient prerequisite for the success of master data. And master data, of course, maintains the capabilities that constrain governance, ex uh, governance acceptiveness, excuse me, that acceptance, effectiveness. That's the word I was looking for there. So we have again our DEMA, DM Bach wheel that we're looking at. And the consultants try to say our methodology here, right? Well, it's really not methodology. It's a realistic way to begin practicing it. So, so I don't like the word methodology, but you probably in order to do MDM right are going to have to do three subsets of this, at least at some level. Reference and master data, of course, would be one. Oftentimes I've mentioned before data quality and data governance. Now this is not to say that these are the three that will be perfect for you in your organization, but it's likely to be not just strictly a focus on reference and master data management, but instead a combination of the three of these. And by the way, if you try four, that may be too many. So most organizations have success with three. Let me give you a, an example of how controlled vocabulary can become critically important to this. This is a group that was going to buy an ERP. Many of you are familiar with ERPs such as SAP or PeopleSoft. They are very fine pieces of software that allow the organization to manage things. And most of these have some master data management components. They, they were able to purchase one of these, but they discovered that the way this ERP worked was that anything that was put into any container at all was going to be considered a retail sale. And while that may be true for some organizations, this organization also had containers that looked like this and this and this and this. And those containers clearly were not retail sales in this. So by using a controlled vocabulary, they did were able to put in the ERP without any modifications to the ERP. They were instead able to allow the organization to work on this, and they just were never allowed to use the word tank without a qualifier. So there was a retail tank, that's the red one, or a retail tank of water, that's the thing at the bottom there. <clears throat> then there was a boat tank and a plane tank and a truck tank and a, an oil tank. tank. Uh, all of these tanks were important and this organization was in fact much better able to manage this in this context. However, there's another type of tank here. And this tank here was very different from the other ones, again, one of the things that's very interesting, and I'm glad to see our colleagues from Ukraine are on this, they have been very successful at defeating the Russians because the Russians don't understand what to put in the tanks of their tanks. Often they mix up diesel and gasoline, and that has caused them innumerable problems throughout the uh, exercise that they've been going through in here. Uh, so um, let's look here at sources of how this stuff tends to work or has tended to work over time. IT has grown up uh, basically in the process of creating individual applications to solve individuals' problems, the payroll problem, the finance problem, the marketing problem, the research and development problem, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these have their own classes of data that evolves around them. With, of course, you can see there's no approach to saying what should be the master data around this. And it becomes obvious when you start exchanging data back and forth among each of these pieces. So we look at this overall challenge and say, my goodness, what is it we're trying to do? Well, 
in a reference data architecture, our starting point, we have some business data stewards who manage codes that we use. Again, the nine gender codes that I gave you in the Canadian system just a little while ago. And that those codes are pushed or controlled out to a reference of record, a database of record that contains the allowable values for reference data. This can be accessed by the various transaction systems and other things. We can extract them to the warehouse and then push them out into our analytic platforms that we're using to analyze the data. Now, from a reference data perspective, we may also bring in external data from the outside and run it through that same exact filter system. The master data architecture looks surprisingly similar. We have a system of record. We have a master record of that database. Where are the customer records? Where are the addresses stored? And how are they propagated throughout here? And that you may have a combined architecture that shows both of these operating in a very similar type fashion. One of the things that's very important for master data to work correctly on though, is when we look at how our existing practices in an organization actually work. And this is the difference between a task versus a process orientation. A task orientation means that we start up with step one through three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in order to build a car or solve a pin or whatever it is. And that the industrial work should, and probably is still in too many organizations in its most simple and basic fashion. The process orientation, however, looks across all of these tasks and says, what are the unifying tasks that are the really value added tasks, reuniting them into a coherent business process. And the part that's really problematic is that most organizations fail to take this additional step of identifying outdated rules uh, that underlie the organization, such as customers don't fix their own equipment. Well, guess what? Uh, many customers are in fact sophisticated to the point where they can do this. So here's a very specific example uh, at one organization that I was working with, they had all of their information in a custom system it was really well done. All of the information to service a customer was gathered together on one screen. They were talked into buying an ERP and that ERP took that same information and spread that information across 23 different screens. Now, I don't know about you, but most human beings have very significant cognitive challenges trying to understand and integrate information across 23 screens while servicing a customer, whether they're on the phone or seated across from them at the table. So a necessary component of master data management is to understand your existing processes. And we have made some very nice progress in the years since I was at the Department of Defense where we developed many of these techniques originally. And that is the process of understanding business process discovery by reading things such as log files and looking at these log files to show the flows and activities, the amounts and durations, and giving us more holistic pictures uh, in order to take a look at these. But let me give you a very specific example, which is one that we're all kind of facing today. For years and years, we tried to replace the internal combustion engine. And while it's a good idea to replace the internal combustion engine. And of course, like Tesla's and all the other fancy things that come with it, most organizations made a mistake of trying to 100% replace this. Whereas once again, Toyota came back here and allowed a hybrid solution. Of course, called a hybrid solution because it has two components. There is a gasoline engine and there's an electric motor. And these work in concert with a battery to charge and uncharge the system. And here's an older version of this. You can see more modern pieces on the system, but here's somebody pressing on the gas pedal and you can see, actually, no, they're, they're pressing on the brake pedal and that's causing the generator to generate electricity and recharge the battery. Uh, once again, again, if you go to accelerate around here, you may start out with the electric motor or if you really step on the accelerator, it puts both the electric and the engine in play to start to push it. Uh, my brand new Prius uh, has almost 200 horsepower, which is sort of an amazing thing for a hybrid engine, but it does speak to the idea that we really understand how the business process works in this particular context. So let's move now to some quick building blocks in order to get started. And a lot of these I'm going to leave for you as reference. Remember, you get a copy of all the slides uh, that come with this. And of course, you're welcome to ask questions of our uh, colleagues as soon as we get to the top of the hour in about 15 minutes, but it makes 
uh, really the idea that we're trying to get one single source of high quality master and reference data, and that we can lower the cost and complexity through reuse and leverage and standards to support business practices that we need to have in order to do these. There are a whole list of activities that we look at in here. Again, I won't read these all to you, but it's really to understand the needs, go through this process and plan and incorporate all of these types of activities in here. It is a multi-year, long-term team approach. It is unlikely that an outside vendor will be able to come in and understand your existing practices in order to do this. So we need to understand, in addition to how the technology works, who needs what information? What data is available from which sources? How do the data from different sources differ? Can we have a process for reconciling these various differences that we have? And how do we share valid business values once we have it? The answer to this is something that I call data branding. Many organizations are now successfully practicing this where you can say all of the data in our organization is of unknown quality. And that could be a very specific problem. But within our master and reference data stacks, we are now able to say this data is of particularly known quality. It doesn't have to be highest quality, but it should be good quality that's there. And that deliverables out of a master data management activity should be some data cleansing services focused specifically on making sure that you meet the requirements for master and reference data, that the data models and documentation exist and are referenceable around the organization so that everybody is literally singing off of the same sheet of paper. This gives you reliable reference and master data or a golden record, if you will, and we can start now to put in place quality measures and reports so that we know whether we're making progress towards the specific goals of the organization. There are a whole series of responsibilities around this. You have a whole series of suppliers and consumers and participants. I'm listing some here for you to get started on, but you should make your own lists of these so that you make sure that you address things in the proper sequence with the proper priorities. Similarly, from a technology perspective, we'll have some components of ETL that are there, a reference or master data management application, and some data modeling tools, process modeling tools, metadata repositories, data profiling tools. And again, Robert will talk about that with respect to Informatica, cleansing tools and data integration tools. That's one of the places that Reltio has some very good specifications. Some organizations find value in business process and rule engines as well. And the last part that is necessary is a change management approach to this. Because of course, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Now I like to start out by saying, build your own uh, in this context. And most people go, wait a minute, build your own? Yeah, build your first master data management system. So here's an example from a hospital that I worked with that was a lot of fun to work. And they simply wanted to keep track of which physicians had admitting privileges in their hospital system. So they took their own SQL Server database. Everybody has one. It's really easy to do. By the way, don't use access uh, on this. And they were able to put in place a process to start collecting master data about the physicians that had admitting practices. And when they got that to work on one system, they added a second system that could access that same reference and master data that they had built and a third system in order to do this. By building their own system, first of all, it was very inexpensive. And most importantly, they were able to learn without paying large amounts of consulting and tool fees initially in order to do this. And when they were ready to have a conversation with the rest of the vendor community to find out what they should in fact graduate to after building this toy, they were then able to have a very educated conversation about that process and eventually replaced the original SQL database here with something that allowed them to add systems to the original piece, but also quickly and easily add additional systems based on the knowledge that they had learned from in the process of doing this. This was occurred over about a three-year period where they were able to come up with a much better approach 
and a much safer approach and overall a cheaper approach than simply buying the original one and waiting for the inevitable two-thirds failure rate uh, around all of this. The reason this is so difficult is because all of these things are inextricably intertwined. We look at quality engineering, master data practices, and knowledge management practices. The metadata practices around this are absolutely critical to make sure that you have good quality master data uh, practices uh, to do this. Again, this may not apply to your organization, but it's pretty widely applicable. Here's another one from a governance perspective as well. Master data management, monitoring, and practices are really key to making sure that governance can be effective in those areas. So let's look a little bit further at some guiding principles and practices. And again, I'm going to go through these rather quick because you all can go back and read them at your leisure on this and review them on a recording if you need to. But overall, there's been less than 100% satisfaction, not through any fault of the tools or our vendors that we have here, but mainly because these things are treated as IT projects and installed, if you will, just like putting in Salesforce without any respect to any sort of uh, 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 quality in there, whereas people can't tell the difference between Salesforce with bad data and Salesforce that works really well with good data in order to do this. So we have very low success rates overall around this. The root cause failures, again, 30% of them are failed out of the box. Many of them are tied to larger service argument architecture pieces or SaaS types of activities. Uh, again, ineffective leadership implemented as a technology or a project. Uh, or as a enterprise data warehouse, it was an IT effort and it was separate from data governance and data quality efforts implemented with inappropriate technology. Internal politics are almost always a problem here. Here are 15 success factors. Once again, I won't read them for you, but the key of course is go slow, grow your own and try to come up with the process that works within your organization around this. Here are some best practices Make sure that you have active, involved executive sponsorship. And gosh, that applies for almost everything. So it's not specific to it, that the business should be doing the governance around this. You need to have strong project management. I've already ref, uh, referenced organizational change management, that you need to have a people process and technology approach in order to building your new information systems, that these be supported by continuous improvement processes. The first version is almost never correct. And that management needs to have an understanding that dedicated data stewards are critical to this type of an activity, that you understand how your hub works and how it integrates with your systems, resisting the urge to customize and stay current with practices. And of course, finally, test, test, test again. Make sure that you share the data and that it belongs to the organization, not to any of the stewards, not to any of the particular owners in there that the goals can't be achieved by one project alone. Business data stewards are accountable and these golden source represent the best sources and the replication of these should only occur from the golden sources. And that you're really trying to understand reference data changes before and requiring formal change management approaches. Now, I'm gonna ask you to, to watch your audio on this next one because this is the best way I have seen any organization introduce the concept of master data management to their organization. The story here is that British Telecom was getting ready to implement theirs. They came up with a wonderful catchy name for it. They called it the Seven Sisters and had the chairman of British Telecom actually send this little animation out that I'm gonna show you. It's 45 seconds long, but it is absolutely phenomenally effective. Uh, if you wanna watch it again or get a copy of it yourself, you can see I've put a link down here at the bottom so that you're welcome to go over to the website and take a look at it. So imagine that you're a person in British Telecom and somebody comes along and you get a letter from the chairman, which of course you open up and take a look at it. And it says this for you.
Parish to say I'm dancing around the airport lounge here and a little bit of fun because it's a wonderful little piece. Now, when British Telecom ran statistics, first of all, they were able to find out that almost everybody who opened this particular uh, email watched the little video multiple times. And as a result of having watched it multiple times, they were able to name some of the seven sisters and the basic root causes of the problem, which was a series of uncoordinated and disparate practices that were put in place in order to look at these things. It's a wonderful little piece. I, it's the most requested piece of artifact that I have in my particular collection. If any others of you have things like that, we'd love to include them with us because this is the purpose of DMA International is to spread all of these words throughout the entire organization and let people have access to them. So we spent a little bit of time here this afternoon looking at data management from an overview perspective, talking specifically about reference and master data management, why they are important, and how to use some building blocks to get them started. I've given you a series of guiding principles and best practices, which are, of course, uh, more or less applicable to your situation, but they function as wonderful guideposts and checklists on this. Let's spend a few short minutes as we get to the top of the hour talking about some takeaways. Now, what you're looking at here is what we call the context diagram for the reference and master data management chapter in this. It starts off at the top here with our definition, planning, implementation, and control activities. Notice it's not a technology to ensure consistency with golden version of our contextual data values. One little quick side note here, but I did some work for Pacific Bell a number of years ago and found out that they had multiple phone numbers uh, for a customer. Uh, now that's the same telephone number. So my telephone number 804-382-5957 was listed at three different places within PAC Bell. So when I had a call or a charge against that number, it was unclear which of those numbers the charge should actually apply to, leaving, of course, money on the floor, something most companies don't like to do. The goals of master data management are to provide these authoritative high quality sources to lower costs and complexity. And that's the key. When we can reduce complexity, we can lower costs much more easily than applying automation in the other direction and support data analytic and information integration activities. There are some inputs, and you can see a catalog here that you should take a look at and see whether these things are important for you or not. There are suppliers of the type of data, again, steering committees, subject matter experts, and there are a whole series of participants. All of these go into the mix in order to try and figure out what are the activities that we need to have. Here's a nice 10 step approach. Understand the needs, identify the sources, define the architecture, implement the solution, define the match rules, establish the gold records, maintain the hierarchies and affiliations, integrate the new data sources, replicate and distribute the various reference and master data, and then manage changes to that particular activity. A wonderful way of describing all of these at once. There are some primary deliverables that you can see here, requirements that come out, the models, the documentation, the golden record data lineage, cleansing services. There are various types of consumers. Don't start out and be comprehensive. Start out with small pieces and grow. Crawl, walk, and run, if you will, as my colleague Lewis always used to say. And uh, again, there's a series of metrics that need to be established here, as well as a whole series of tools around all of these. When you look at this overall, this is one of the best ways to describe it. And if you're working in this area, I recommend printing off this slide and putting it right there by your cube or your machine or wherever it is that you have. And periodically coming back and making sure that you are at least addressing all of these various types of activities here. Because if you don't, you will have definite challenges that are associated with this. Again, primarily related to the fact that most people buy a technology solution. It's implemented by IT with no thought to business process reconciliation. And consequently, it is a bad match for the organization due in absolutely no fault to the vendors. It's due instead to the poor implementation on the part of most organizations. I've given you a series of references here that talk about some of these things in particular data. Lotion's book on master data management, even though it's a bit dated, uh, has some really good pieces in it. There's some additional references here for you. Just click on the links and 
again, of course, my publisher wants you to make sure that you're going to at least pay attention to some of my books in here. We've got some really wonderful upcoming events that Shannon and I are going to be doing, which the next one is a first for us. We're doing core concepts in data ethics. And Shannon, with that, we're back over to you. Peter, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. As always, if you have questions for Peter or for Suta or Robert, feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of your screen and we will get to those. Uh, so diving in here, just, or just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. So um, it, this came in pretty early, um, Peter, so, uh, um, but, and so you kind of address some of this, but are you sure that reference data is just a slow moving version of master data? Yeah, I can, I can take that, Shannon. Uh, so basically what we mean by that is if you look at the uh, list of records, like, you know, you, uh, the, the entire set of data, you'll have lots of variation of the first name, middle name, last name, addresses, address line one and things like that. But if you look at the country's zip code, uh, you know, uh, type of identifiers. So that's basically the finite list of types that you would have, finite list of zip codes and uh, those kind of things. Of course, you will get more zip codes, more types and all of that. So that's what we meant by it's a slow moving from the entire data point of view, right? But uh, from, from the record point of view, yeah, you can have the address is changing very frequently for customers or, or for individual and things like that. But from the from the data standpoint in the system, you will have those values that you can standardize because it's a finite number of records, finite number of values, and which can grow, but it doesn't move as fast as like in you know, a different variation of the first name, for example. So, so Chen, you would certainly agree that reference data has had a tendency to move slower than master data, but I do agree with you. It is it is a distinct category. Well, and and adding a little bit to that, I mean, I agree that there are definitely certainly categories of reference data that move slowly, but then reference data can also include more of your finance hierarchies and dimensions, which, depending upon the industry and the company can have a lot of volatility and movement. I saw quite a bit of that in financial services um, as they change, update, reorg, especially looking at a merger, acquisition, et cetera. I mean, country boundaries never change, right, guys? <laughs> We've lived through enough change to understand this ourselves. So absolutely, absolutely. Great question. Thanks for asking. Indeed. So I come from a long data engineering background, recently starting um, more interested in data governance. And it seems there are two core tech things outside of all social activities, use governance tool plus tag databases, column level. But also I found there should exist a third semantic layer, thin layer on top of the core tables to hold business concept as provider active, um, et cetera, to avoid these the great mess I see everywhere where SQL code replicates business rules, which over time lead to incoherence. I created one uh, a semantic layer like this um, and business was crazy happy with added value of the new uh, set of tables. I suppose there's a connection and with MDM with the governance. That is a wonderful uh, observation. And yes, absolutely. Again, I'm sure my colleagues agree with me. The key is that within Governance. Governance is what decides whether or not you are, in fact, looking at the correct uh, scope for these types of activities. Governance is the kind of thing that will allow you to say, hey, not today, maybe not the first version, maybe in the second version. So absolutely, these three core concepts are absolutely linked and integrated in there. And it's hard to do one well without incorporating aspects of the others as well. What do my colleagues want to add to that? No, I agree with it with that, yeah. Peter. I mean, they work together as well as reinforce each other um, in the process because you you need the controls on what's entered and what's done, uh, so business knows um, and can trust in that data. So, you any yeah. specific examples, thanks, Robert. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, something that was mentioned here, right? The the third semantic layer on top of the core table to hold the business concept. So basically, we, we uh, look at this as something that you can derive out of, you know, some 
uh, the data that was brought in, right? Based on the, the dates, for example, is the record active? When was the last infraction done? So those kind of, uh, kind of insights that can be built on top of it, but you need to have that, you know, a cleansed, unified uh, data to, to work with. So I agree that you know, the data governance uh, is like super important here. And when we talk about a semantic layer, it does not have to be physically separate. It can be conceptual. I've seen some organizations incorporate aspects of semantics by simply incorporating tagging capabilities mm -hmm. in with their master and reference data so that you can segregate it by people, process, and things, or, uh, you know, again, the, the uh, customer hierarchy that I gave as an example earlier on. So while they have all these fancy terms that we like to use, again, semantics sounds great. Gosh, we haven't mentioned AI yet in this, but certainly organizations are now starting to incorporate AI in this as well. Once again, be careful, of course, of the hallucinations, but does it in fact make sense to say that if I've got a pile of data over here that has reference and master data in it, and I start to do some data mining or machine learning through those activities, we could train an AI model to better understand customer behavior and certain types of customers uh, that would be relevant to this. And again, that data can be incorporated into the reference and master data technologies that you're looking at as well. Great question. Indeed. So how can you measure whether your MDM practices are effective? Excellent question. Uh, do either of you have measures that you've used to start off with for a starter set when organizations get going on this? Yeah, so I can, um, I, I uh, sorry, can I take that? Yeah, go ahead, Sujit. Yeah, so I, I had a slide there which talks about the, the, the business outcomes, right? So there, is, there are three things that we, um, we have seen customers basically uh, try to prioritize, right? Growth uh, and, and manage risk and compliance. Uh, and so the, the way we uh, do this is like, you know, we have those three big kind of, you know, use cases, ready to activate. And if you can kind of check one of those boxes, right? that you were able to bring data and you were able to serve one of those use cases. So that is one way to kind of, you know, measure the success of the implementation. It might be like, you know, a very controlled implementation to, to uh, meet one of those boxes that I was talking about. Great, thanks, Robert. Any, any thoughts on that? Um, yes, uh, as far as being able to measure it, I think the the first key that we see is the return on that investment. How quickly can they start seeing value out of the implementation and is it successful for moving forward their business and allowing them to do it? To give you an example, we had a um, insurance company was able to move from one financial system to another and save um, you know, about 40% in their man hour time doing that. So that in itself is a tangible savings as well as, you know, when you start looking at efficiency and there's other pieces as well. So excellent. another example to think about is sort of a meta example around all of this, which is that most organizations really do not have a well understood process architecture. And consequently, they don't know how often things occur or when those things occur that are, are problematic. So this is where a diagram such as reverse engineering your existing processes can look at. Uh, again, this is this data is obtained by mining the log files of some key systems in here. And some people look at this and say, oh my goodness, standard orders only go straight through 86% of the time, which means that 14% are subject to some additional processing in here. And what our goal should be is to reduce that, assuming that that's relevant for your organization. Other organizations may say 86% is a great solution and that what we really want to do is uh, try to improve the outbound delivery record. So it gives you a record and a, a map of where should I focus my additional efforts? What measures can we in fact get easily that don't have to be developed in addition to this? And, and how are these helpful? And without that sort of a good grounding in the measures, it's very hard to talk about performance. People simply say, you know, sales are down or the leads are really terrible. And none of those are very helpful critiques. What we really need to know is which sales are down and then why, and then which leads are the type that most often 
produce results for us? And can we focus on those aspects of it? So once again, great question on this. We love when you guys do this because it's not something we can incorporate into the general program, but we can certainly tease it out here afterwards in our discussion. Great. So um, this came in, uh, Robert, during at the end of your presentation. Does uh, does this have the ability to apply retention and trigger disposal? We do have the ability to do the um, retention identification. As far as the disposal, um, we really would see that more as an intentional action because typically on the reference in, in master data, you may need that or identify why it's going away. Um, Maybe with some advice from the lawyers, Robert? Uh, no. Well, in some cases, it could be depending on the data set. Um, you're, you're right. But uh, no, on the it's more that the end users um, are controlling this and it's a business focus there. So. And of course, understanding the existing business practices is key to making sure that your master data management approach is going to complement your existing practices as opposed to conflict with them. Uh, Suchin, I'm sure you've seen lots of examples where people try to put a square peg in a round hole and they have difficulties as a result. Yeah. Uh... Right. So, uh, so basically, uh, we we do have that capability where you can kind of you know uh, track that uh, and kind of capture the reason behind it. Uh, so we do uh, kind of you know support those kind of things, and we have seen that kind of you know a common occurrence rate. Yeah, and y'all are forewarned. Uh, ignore it at your peril. Great question. Thanks. And there was a question that came on early, uh, just, you know, and we touched on it, you touched on it a little bit, Peter, but um, can you discuss scrubbing and DI uh, identification of PI and PII for analytical data? Well, um, let's go back to the integration of master data management and data governance activity. Um, it's probably inappropriate to have the people who are governed, who are running your master data management determine whether the scrubbing activities have been in fact sufficient. That should be a shared responsibility with data governance to say, how much scrubbing can I do and how much um, does this put the organization at risk for somebody being able to find out, uh, you know, later on by pulling additional data together and, and running exposed pieces. So really it goes back to that integration of quality governance and master data management as a integrated activity, as opposed to uh, individual pieces that are, are disparate from that. Uh, it, it just happens so often that, you know, people from, an, let's just go ahead and pick on data science perspective. They do something because they can do it, not necessarily because they should do it. And that's a, a mantra that should be focused over and over again. And you can, to some degree, use master and reference data management activities to put guardrails around some of those activities and help to keep the organization from inadvertently stepping in something that may end up costing it time and money. Again, Robert Sujan, any thoughts on that? PII and scrubbing. Well, in, in the case of reference itself, you don't see as much PII data that occurs more on the party model or um, pure MDM side more so. But there are some exceptions where we do see where reference would support that. Example would be if you look at disease diagnostic codes, there is a classification for sensitivity codes that need to be filtered or handled another way that you would identify through those disease diagnostic codes where reference would be influencing that. So that would be my comment on that. Sucha? Thanks, Sucha. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, we, we have seen that, you know, like uh, uh, Peter, you mentioned, uh, this typically handle uh, using the, uh, the integration uh, layer, right? And, but uh, that there are some controls and uh, like, uh, uh, the security controls, the, the the authentication control that you can put in uh, to limit the access to that data. But I agree uh, with Robert that with the reference data, we don't see much of this PI, uh, PII information in there. Uh, yeah. 
So let me let me put Shannon on the spot here for a second. Shannon, is that okay? Uh, what you're gonna so what you're gonna ask? <laughs> so so if I had to ask you, what would you think would be the worst type of automobile that you could have from a health data management perspective? And I know that's a very strange question. From a health data management perspective. Mm hmm. Mm. That is a good question. I don't know. I can think of vehicles that I'm not fond of. <laughs> exactly. Different different stories all the way around. So it turns out that an SUV is actually the worst type of vehicle to have if you're trying to get healthcare insurance. Because the healthcare uh, companies are out there buying uh, social data. And if you post on the web that I just got a new SUV, that almost immediately becomes a black mark against you in terms of your healthcare record. Why, you might ask? Well, it turns out that the big doors in an SUV tend to support people who have a more sedentary lifestyle and therefore become higher risks from a health insurance perspective. And yes, that is absolutely wrong, but there's no law against it right now. So if you go to any of these health conferences, their master data management solutions are now including things like the automobile type that you drive which should be absolutely against the law, but currently is not. Uh, if that doesn't scare some of you, I don't know what will, but boy, that was a, a real ouch to find out recently about this. Amazing how uh, data can be used um, <laughs> for good or, or for, for not. Um, well, let's continuing on here though with the questions, I'm gonna move on before quote unquote collection, should not the first data management specialized skill be data planning? Oh, well, of course, just no question about it. And if, if we didn't uh, hit on that, then that's certainly my my error. Uh, again, I'm certain both of my colleagues agree planning on it. And I, I think at least on this chart, it says number one, understand and reference and master data integration needs. So. The design with the end in mind is probably the best way to to think of it. You've got to know the destination for your data if you're going to design it and uh, set up the process as well. Hey, Jim, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. The <clears throat> data planning is very crucial. Like you, in order to understand what is that you're going to, or what you want to achieve, you need to understand what is that you need to put in place to serve that. Uh, kind of outcome. So absolutely, I agree with that, that data planning is definitely a must have skills before you get into the data management and also understanding the context of each of those uh, data attribution or data kind of elements that you're planning to manage, right? They all have kind of you know, different behavior, different uh, kind of traits and whatnot. So understanding what is that you're going to uh, bring in uh, will align with the outcome that you want to begin with. Thank you to our questioner for reinforcing that absolutely critical point. So lots of great questions come in. We've got about 10 minutes left. We've got lots of time here, so keep them coming. So at what point is it feasible to engage in MDM? Is it when data governance, data quality, and reference data management are on the way? I would certainly say that if you aren't already, you should be thinking about it, but that this build your own process is particularly good for helping to establish the business case. So again, just to review, this is a hospital situation that took a SQL Server database and built a single implementation master data management to focus just strictly on admitting privileges throughout the hospital system. It was a small project. It took them a year to implement the first piece. They did a great job and they learned a ton in the process. They were able to add more systems to that initial stack. And by the time they were in fact ready to talk to our vendors in this, they were able to have a good conversation. Maybe that's a question I should ask uh, our, our colleagues on this. Do you find that customers are mature enough, have a mature enough understanding of their existing organizations and processes when they first come to you uh, so that they can in fact be successful at this as opposed to what I see in many cases whereas they go in and somebody like uh, oh let's just call them big four will come in and say sure you're ready for this and here's 60 million dollars and uh, you know they pay for it and they're gone and, and you know three years later 
people don't know where to stick the data. So they stick it in the MDM, which means you've lost all aspect of quality and governance, much less master data around those topics. Who wants to go first? I think on, uh, we see most customers, I mean, yeah. the customers come in oftentimes thinking they need, you know, they'll come in and say, well, I, I'm sure I just need data governance. And then with the proper discovery and, and um, conversations, you find out it's not only governance, but it also has aspects of whether that's MDM, maybe data quality, that's really their issue once you get under the covers and start um, understanding a bit more. Uh, but as far as your example there, you know, Peter, I think what I worry about today with uh, how quick we're able to do things in a SaaS environment, the cost overall for that support for that year of building, I think the cloud has really moved that a bit out where you, if you have a tool and you can start the process in that application, because it's not only just building the the uh, database itself and, and what it's doing, but it's that delivery to those downstreams, those integrations, where you start to really see those cost savings. So, good for our thoughts. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, when we, we have seen like, you know, customer is uh, pretty uh, knowledgeable about the, the MDM as a concept, but the, the, the kind of discussions or conversation that we have with our customer is basically understand what is that you want to achieve, right? So going back to those nine boxes that I was talking about, growth efficiency and managing risk and compliance. Uh, when, when you start with like, you know, hey, I want to build this MDM, you start getting into the discussion of, okay, what all things I can put in there. Instead of that, we want to basically start uh, prescribing based on the outcome that you want to achieve, right? So if you pick any of those nine boxes that I shared earlier, sales effectiveness or M&A integration or partner collaboration or auditing or compliance reporting, our model basically tells you that, you know, for you to kind of get the outcome here, then these are the set of attributes or these are the set of entities and these are the set of systems that you need to bring in, right? So that's the kind of, you know, conversation helps in, in uh, not making it like, you know, about getting data in a centralized place and just matching, merging. That's not what it is, right? So it, it's about achieving a business outcome. So that's what this nine boxes kind of, you know, becomes like a more prescriptive model and, and guide you around what kind of data that you have to go uh, kind of bring into the system for you to be successful. Excellent comments from both of you. And again, notice that the master data management is on an upward curve. So we are seeing people gaining understanding of this more rapidly than we were in the past. And the practices around this have matured, both from an organizational understanding, as well as from the offerings from the vendors in this area that can help you get to success faster. And I think it was Robert earlier that mentioned faster return on investment in this. You have to of course, be able to measure that return on investment, but it is absolutely considered best practice that if, if you're trying to do a lot of things with data and you haven't started with master and reference data, you're probably not headed in the right direction. And, and adding a little bit to that, that, Peter, I think it's also the maturity where companies are understanding that data is an asset. Prior to that, it was, you know, physical assets, items, places, locations. Now they're understanding data. And if you, we use an example, take American Airlines, who realize that their um, frequent flyer program was actually worth more than the airlines. And they have sought to monetize that. That's an example of where they've understood that their um, data is worth, you know, the data is an asset for them. You're exactly right. And I love that. That's from a Forbes article back in the middle of the pandemic. And American Airlines was valued at $6 billion U.S. dollars but the data in the frequent flyer program had been valued as high as $30 billion. And my question was, gosh, Robert, why don't you and I pool our money together, buy American Airlines for $6 billion, keep the data, and then turn around and resell American Airlines for maybe $6 billion to somebody else, and we'd have $30 billion of data in our hands for free. But of course, it's just not that easy, is it? It's not, unfortunately. Uh, of course, I don't have an extra $3 billion lying around, and I'm pretty sure you don't either, but maybe Informatica does. So. <laughs> 
Perfect. So we've got about six minutes left. So for large, oh, sorry, Susan, were you speaking? I, I can... No. Gotcha. Okay. I think it's but, Peter's yeah. background. Yeah. Okay. For a large multi geography with multiple languages organization, where each organization maintains all its local systems of records and customers, what would be the recommended approach to implement MDM for customer entity? That, of course, is going to depend on local customers and variations and laws. And there was a law, for example, that said if you had Brazilian data, you could never take the data on Brazilian citizens outside of the country. Uh, Amazon subdivides its cloud section into various regions in order to support that type of customization around it. All of these things are considerations that are important to integrate in addition to the other things that we've all described. Uh, do my colleagues want to add anything to that? I think the, yeah, the other uh, thing, oh, sorry, go on, Sachin. Sorry, no, I, I was just going to add that uh, basically, like Peter mentioned, right, understanding the, the laws uh, and regulations of of the, uh, of the uh, uh, basically the country that you are going to manage data for, that is very important. You know, so certain countries basically allow you to uh, store data outside of those countries but it cannot be accessed, right, by, by the other um, uh, uh, people outside of that country. So those kind of things can still be in one system, but many uh, organizations basically do not allow the data to go outside of the country. So we have this kind of, you know, um, multiple implementation kind of interacting and talking to each other um, to, to, to kind of, you know, share information. So we have that kind of setup as well. And it, looking looking at the the question, I know it also talks about the the physical location of the data, but it also the question specifically talks about the different um, the data in different languages, and I think that gets back to how you store that and the association with the record, whether that's physically stored with the record or or a you know along with it and then how you do the translation. So giving you the ability to be able to bring that in as well as be able to handle those uh, code sets, whether those are single or multi-byte characters, because if you bring in, you know, Japanese, that's multi-byte, whereas, you know, English, Spanish, et cetera, um, doesn't require the same type of field to store that. And that's, you know, all, you know, accomplishable in the uh, Informatica solution, but... Um, I think that's the other side of it as well as making sure you can have those language storage as well. So. And I, once again, I think ignore those considerations at your absolute peril because we've all seen disasters that have occurred when organizations simply say, oh, great, I'll just open this up and we'll see what happens, right? Well, probably not going to be a good outcome. Indeed. Well, I... Thank you all so much for a great presentation as always, Peter. And thanks to Informatica and Realtio for helping, for sponsoring this webinar and to helping these make these webinars happen. Appreciate uh, Robert and Sujan, you guys joining us today. Welcome, good to meet thank everyone. Absolutely, and thanks to all Robert and Sujan, thank you for great discussion. Thank you, Peter. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you. And just a reminder to all of our attendees, thanks for being so engaged in everything we do. Uh, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording along. And so hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks, y'all. Shannon, thanks again. Great, great job posting it as always. I know I don't need to tell you that, but we're so fortunate to have you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.